But the hard decision was never one for Liam to shy away from, as he began a career that was to take him from the back streets of Dublin to the centre of European football and the heights of the most demanding game in the world. Liam has won all the honours and wealth the game can bestow, but probably the hardest journey was the very first, when he went on his own for a trial at mighty Arsenal. I finished up going to London in the summer. Uh, I remember it was either July, June or July, uh, when I was 13. I can remember going up to London Colony at Highbury on the bus with all the other boys, and uh, you know, being a little bit scared, but you know, sensing this was a big chance. Uh, and, uh, it, well, it all went very, very well. Uh, I didn't start off particularly well the match, uh, but as the game went on, I, I played really, really well. And I could tell by the reaction of everyone after that game that I'd, uh, I'd come through with flying colours, as they say. I think one of the qualities of an outstanding player, and it's a little bit difficult to define, but they always have time on the ball. They said then there's nothing hurried about them. And this is what uh, Chippy had. He, he, he had time on the ball. And obviously Liam was outstanding, even then at 13 years of age. He used to come over every school holiday and he'd take part in training and he'd be thrown in with, with, with players who were perhaps two or three years older than him. And he really was an outstanding player. But he came in with a, a marvellous uh, attitude to the game, a love for the game, a warmth for the game. Uh, wanted to learn about the game. Uh, and could do things that made people envious. And, uh, I mean, a blind man could have seen that he was going to be a bit special. As part of his testimony, Liam is giving something back to the people of Dublin, who obviously feel so strongly about him. He's a model sportsman, and he has always been very popular in Dublin. He has uh, made a donation of £50,000. And that's a substantial amount of money. So we're very grateful for that. Um, but also, his personal involvement is worth a fortune. More than 50,000 pounds. And being involved means bringing out the crowds to hear the anti-drugs message. Now, I, th I think you all know that Liam Brady is one of our own in the north city of Dublin. He was born in Whitehall, and he has won for himself and for his city and for his country the highest of honour. But above all else, he is a great gentleman on the sports field, a great sportsman, and somebody of whom we are all very, very proud indeed. As you know, I'm a footballer, uh, but I, and it's great for me to see the kids out there practicing their skills because uh, it keeps them away from the darker side of life. But there are real alternatives to drugs. Sport is the one great one that I know of. So really, I wanted to just go along there and give them a little bit of support, and a little bit of encouragement to combat the problem. And it was in Whitehall, in the heart of Dublin, that Liam first kicked a ball. And we call it a keyhole, which is, is ex exactly the shape it was. Uh, and uh, we used to have some tremendous, tremendous games there. Lots of broken windows, though. But uh, I think most, uh, most parents' kids were out on the street, so nobody complained too much. Liam was born in the National Maternity Hospital in Hollis Street. 13th February 1956. And he was quiet. He, well, he really was a very quiet child, wasn't he, Eddie? Yeah. Never gave any trouble. And when he, I think he started to walk at 10 months old. 
And at 12 months, he was out there at that gate because they always played football, all the boys from around in, in the cul de -sac. And that's where it all started. Her, my father worked on the docks, uh, very tough, tough life, tough job. I uh, had to sail, sail away with cattle uh, nearly every evening uh, from uh, Dublin to Holyhead. And, uh, you know, it was a very hard job for him, but I, I can't ever remember him being ill or being sick because he simply had to go. He, he really did, uh, did work hard for the family, and, and my mother on the other side was left alone to cope because he was away uh, all through the night. It was always football here all the time. Daddy and I, we go to soccer matches in the mornings on a Sunday to look at Paddy and Ray, and then we go off to the big stadium, Crow GAA, Park. Crow Park, to look at the Gaelic football in the afternoon. So we were football crazy. This is a, a huge sporting tradition in my family. Um, soccer was uh, my great uncle. Uh, my grandfather's brother, Frank, he represented Ireland and played cross-channel professional football. Uh, my two elder brothers, uh, Ray and Pat, they left when they were 18, 19 to come to England to play football. A special celebrity round of golf for the testimonial gives four of the Brady brothers the chance to team up. He was always had a little ball carried around with him, kicking it in the front room against my mother's china cabinet. <laughs> Which was the goal, you know. You know, right from the start, you could you could tell, looking at him, that he was something special, you know. Well, he was born into a footballing family, so obviously he had the motivation. And we used to play ball in the house, rag ball, kicking to each other. And I remember saying to him, you should kick with the other foot, because he started on the right foot. I don't know whether he remembers that or not. <laughs> but uh, he started using his left foot, and I left for England then, so I didn't see his early years as a a footballer and uh, well now he's a left footed player. I used to buy Goal that time, Goal was the name of the book and he had all the footballers, George Best, any good footballer in England he had them and he used to cut them out right around them but I used to tell him Liam you have cut George Best's leg off, it's gone, <laughs> he'd be cutting it too near. Football, football, football all the time. Well, the first game I, I think I was, uh, uh, that sticks in my mind was when my brother uh, Ray played for Ireland against Austria in 63. Um, yeah, it was a big occasion for our family. I can remember the occasion in a big way. And I think it was then that I decided, well, you know, if I can, I'd, lo I'd love to be a professional footballer. And what attracted me most was the, the combination of all of it, but yet uh, I think it was, uh, the sense I got from watching football and from being in, in crowds like that, that they actually worship the players who are on the pitch. And uh, that seemed most attractive for me. So uh, it was probably the fact that you're a hero if you were playing out there. Well, I always remember going up to the park, watching Liam as well. And he just never wanted to come home. He just wanted to play football all the time. And he spoke about nothing else, only football. He had no other interest at all. And at the park around the corner, he played for St Kevin's, where Des Lawler was his first coach. 24 years ago, Liam Brady started his football career as an eight-year-old playing like this here in Allenfield Park. Well, Liam, when he came to us at eight years of age, he was quite outstanding. He was always a tremendous club man. Not only was he a great player, but he was tremendous interest in the club. And on one club tour, Liam's enthusiasm led him to bending the rules, if not actually breaking them. I noticed this player on the other pitch where our B team were playing, I noticed this player um, beating three or four players and scoring a tremendous goal. As I got nearer the pitch, I realised that it was actually Liam. He'd come off the first, after the first game was over, uh, asked on the sideline what score the game was and he was told we were getting beaten 2-1 and in his own words I'll soon change that. So he slipped onto the pitch, scored and then slipped off again without anybody knowing anything whatsoever about it. And something went down my life when he stopped playing, you know. 
because <clears throat> you never knew what he was going to do. Every week you went out and you said, what's this young fellow going to do with the ball? He was that good. I've seen great ones, but he was the best I've ever seen. But not everyone was so appreciative of young Liam's soccer skills. I was playing under a fairly new school in the, in the district, uh, St. Aidan's Sea Christian Brothers School, and uh, strong traditions in Gaelic football and hurling. Towards the end of my time at the school, uh, I was selected to play for Ireland in a school by international, to captain Ireland in a school by international. And uh, it clashed with a, a challenge match. A challenge match is, is not a competitive match, it's just a friendly game. And uh, the, the head brother in the school told me that uh, you know, if I chose to play for Ireland, uh, I shouldn't come back to the school. As always, I chose soccer. <laughs> and uh, I'm afraid I had to leave the school. But despite that setback, public recognition and trophies weren't slow in coming. And Liam became Dublin's hottest footballing property. So I remember being, uh, finishing one game one day, I was told. There'd been a scout from Arsenal there to watch the game. And uh, this, is, this is what I'd been kind of hoping for for, uh, for the previous years or whatever. And um, yeah, I was told uh, he'd been watching, been particularly impressed, and had uh, gone around to my house to see my mother. So I changed as quickly as I possibly could and on my bike and flew home around to the house. And, uh, by then they'd gone, but uh, my mother had the good news for me that uh, they would, they wanted me to come over to Highbury and uh, and have a trial at Arsenal. So uh, th that was good enough for me. I was on cloud nine. That trial game at Arsenal went superbly, and so at just 15 years of age, Liam moved away from his school, his friends, and his home to live in London. This time, when it came for real. Uh, after a good few weeks or a couple of months, I began to get a little bit homesick. Uh, and uh, come Christmas time, I was really, really homesick. Uh, so as, a, as apprentice professionals, you're allowed to go home for Christmas. So I went home for Christmas and uh, decided I was going to stay home. That uh, it wasn't for me. It was all a little bit too much for me. But uh, as quickly as I decided to stay home, uh, I got bored at home after a few weeks and uh, the penny dropped with me that uh, I really wanted to be a professional footballer and I came back and uh, I don't think it was any coincidence that my form improved, my concentration improved because I knuckled down to what I wanted to achieve. I think you found it quite hard at first coming from Ireland. Uh, I was fortunate, I lived, in, lived at home still so I was still having parents and my old friends. But Liam didn't, and uh, I think he found it quite tough at first on that side. Um, but he always, I think anyone with uh, half an eye would have known he was going to be a, a bit special. He had tremendous skill. He, he was very slight at that time, um, which perhaps he didn't stand out quite so much straight away. But he, you know, he always had that ability in it. It was obviously only a matter of time before he really flourished. In my early days at West Ham, I was youth manager, and uh, we played in what they call the South East Counties League. Arsenal youth team played in that same league and uh, one can remember a very frail young man about 15, 16 years of age but with m a marvellous elegance about him. I think that's the way, best way of putting it. Uh, when he had the ball in his left foot you felt he could do anything with it and there was obviously a great prospect and a great talent for the future. I remember Alan Ball joined uh, my second year uh, and uh, he was a great influence on me. Well, he could do things that I couldn't coach him, and he could do things that I couldn't do, which is why he became a great player, because his natural ability uh, to wrong-foot people, to pass the ball long and short, to, um, to master that ball, to control that ball, had all those in all. And when he came over, he looked like a little... Well, looked like a little bit of wet lettuce, really. There was nothing of him. Um, but the moment you put him into a game situation in training, then you could see that he had an outstanding talent. And so we did work a bit at building him up, and uh, he liked a lot of chips as well, which is why he became called Chippy, and not because he chipped the ball. And uh, maybe that had some contribution in building him up. Chips were his main dish.
to the doctor one time and he said it's good food, isn't it? I said he won't eat anything, only chips. He said he's eating good food. So <laughs> he, he didn't do it too badly, I know. At that time he was a very uh, frail looking fellow. I used to think, well, how can this lad be a footballer really? He's not, he's not, uh, he's not built to be a footballer. But it was like a different personality when he went on the pitch. He was very expressive and uh, when, when the ball was at his feet, it was just like a different fella altogether. On a Friday in, in most clubs, the team sheets go up and uh, I naturally went to look at the combination team sheet and it, my name wasn't there. And I couldn't really figure this out uh, until some lads came back from the first team, some apprentices came back from the first team dressing room, they'd been doing their duties there. And they told me that I was in the first team squad. That first game, Liam, at just 17, came on as substitute. His performance even then hit the headlines. The following week, Liam ran out in the Arsenal colours to start a match for the first time, and the Brady bandwagon began to roll. The man who was one of the finest footballers of his own generation, Mr. Liam Brady. Liam Brady's testimonial dinner in Dublin. An opportunity that gives the soccer world the chance to meet and to pay tribute to a unique talent. From the stars of today to legends like the great Sir Stanley Matthews. He could play at any level, you know. You just got that coolness and awareness on the ball, confidence on the ball. Magic left foot. One of the few left foots that you see of that class. Just a great player and a great person. The bigger the star, the nicer the bloke, and they don't come any nicer than Liam Brady. A guy with a natural talent. Um, he's not man-made, he's not been moulded into anything special. He is his own man, he is um, something that I, I honestly think we're not going to see the likes of again. A lot of footballers were manufactured on this earth, but the likes of Liam Brady and Pat Jennings and Georgie Best, they were sent to us from heaven. As, as Liam got stronger, he, he progressed very quickly. Even sort of month by month, you could tell he was improving you know, that much, which is it's quite something when you're working with him day in, day out. If you, you've gone away and come back a month later and see someone, you can see the improvement. But you could actually, every month, you could see he'd improved um, and was getting better and better and as he got stronger. And by the time he was probably 18, uh, 19, he, you know, he was really outstanding. But even with Liam's talent, the Arsenal team were going through a lean spell. And after one bad result, the youngsters got singled out for blame and some extra training. I said, that's totally unfair. They're picking on us because we're the youngest ones and easier to pick on. No way I'm coming in in the morning. And Liam then proceeded to persuade me to come in. He said, oh, it's bad for our career and we better really do as we're told. I've got to come, I'm going to come in. And uh, it looked bad if they think they've got the better of me and not the better of you. I think we ought to come in. And he went on for about a quarter of an hour this way, and I said, OK. And I thought I'd do it for Liam, sort of thing. And, uh, and then, lo and behold, Sunday morning I turned out and Liam didn't. Well, I think when, when you grow up with somebody uh, in the same youth team and you, you, you carry on and go on the reserves and the first team, you, you tend to know what they're going to do. And I think uh, that's, that's what happened. When, when I played with Liam, I knew what he was going to do. I knew when he was going to put the ball in the box, or I knew when he was going to put the ball into space. And I, I could be there and uh, show him for the ball, and uh, it helped to develop my game. Uh, I benefit more from playing with Liam Brady than, than, I, than Liam Brady benefited from playing with me, I would have said. It, it had everything going. He had great ability on the ball and his vision. And there was, there's so many good things, and I'm talking in the, in the attacking part of football, that Liam could do almost anything. Within two years, he started to control the team. He was the playmaker. He was the fellow that everybody passed the ball to. And he constructed things. He always had this ability. And the older he got, the more it became. Give it to Liam, Liam will sort it out for us. Give it to Liam, he'll hit the through ball. Give it to Liam, he'll score a goal. Leeds were on the way to winning yet another title and uh, I was up against Giles in midfield. I was particularly keen to do well because he was manager of the Irish team at the time. And, uh, well, Leeds, needless to say, 
beat us 3-1. But after the match, Giles came to me and said, uh, well done, and that he'd you know, be getting in touch. So that was a great, another great breakthrough for me. Well, Liam is what we would call a natural, natural footballer. Very uh, well-balanced, beautiful skills, give the ball to him in a tight area, and he'll, he'll create something from it. He's, he's, he's a creator. As most people, as a painter, they'll create something from nothing Liam does on the football pitch, except it's in movement. And he is a natural player in that he knows when to release the ball, the best angles to take. And I think if you see football, a lot of football is in slow motion, then you see the real poetic uh, movements of the players and Liam in slow motion, well, in quick motion as well as slow motion, but particularly in slow motion, you can see the beautiful moves that he can make. And at his first national training session, Liam was told by Johnny Giles that he was in the team at 18 years of age. In the two days preceding the match, he was quiet. He more or less kept to himself. I found out afterwards why. He was genuinely fearful. And I couldn't understand this. I said, you know, why? Because you played in front of 50,000 last week. And I always remember, he said, oh no, I said, my family, you know, my brothers, my mother, my father, they're going to see me. Uh, he performed all right. He was absolutely magnificent. Liam took that centre stage and took the game by the scruff of the neck and, and made it easy for the experienced players. And he was doing this at 18 years of age. It was possibly the most precocious talent I've seen. It was obviously probably a brave move for, uh, for Giles to pick him so early. But, I mean, after 15 minutes on the pitch, <laughs> all those doubts were gone, you know, because Liam had such, uh, such class and such uh, maturity for an 18-year-old. I mean, he was just strolling around the pitch as if he'd been playing for 10 years. It was just, well, it was fabulous to see a, a new talent coming so quickly for us. Russia at the time were one of the best sides in Europe and uh, we beat them 3-0 in Dublin. Um, and I mean, it was sort of no fluke. We, we sort of paralyzed them really with uh, Liam, Johnny Giles. And I mean, I happened to get the three goals. So for, from my point of view, it was a great memory as well. Great performance. Uh, Don's goals stick out. But, uh, I remember playing a few one-twos with Giles in the middle of the park, and you know, people were, could, were saying, oh, yeah. I could hear the, the reaction of the crowd. Say, look, they were, you know, they're only playing together this one time, but yet we were on the same wavelength. It was great, great feeling. Well, the general makeup in the late 70s uh, tended to be more on the on Irish team uh, with people like Lame and David O'Leary and Frank Stephen, Pat Jennings, Pat Rice, myself, John Devine and there was a sort of more homely atmosphere and the, I suppose one of the, the rising factors was that we were actually sort of starting to develop a team with the right blend. And you, had, you had seven players, uh, Irish players there and uh, I've been 17 years now at Arsenal and uh, over that four to five year period it was it was the best time of my life. I know I've won the championship and other things since then, but as a as a group of people, um, they were the best people that I ever had. And at Arsenal, was the best uh, period atmosphere-wise Arsenal ever had. Lamb's chief role was really to orchestrate midfield, to sort of combine um, his ability to to pass the ball and, and also to actually to get into the penalty area and, and score goals. Um, because he was very effective, he was not only a playmaker, but he had a great skill in taking on defenders in and around the penalty area. And uh, he's deceptively quick. Chippy was, um, was the outstanding young player of that era. And that uh, with midfield players like he coming through, defenders like David O'Leary, Frank Stapleton, Graham Ricks was following behind Liam, that the future of Arsenal Football Club looked um, quite fantastic, very exciting. Just hit it off. If he went down the wing, I'd go inside. They're simple things, but we're just uh, both on the same wavelength and both young lads wanting to do it. And uh, it was, I feel honoured, me, to say that I played with Liam Brady. It was a simple lad. Uh, down the pub, game of darts, you know, and he, had, he was a superstar. I mean, there's 50,000 at Ivory shouting his name out. 
Then he'd be down the Queen's Head after having a pint and a game of darts with the lads. Fantastic player, great left foot, and as I say, the bottom line, the best midfield player I've ever played with. But he had a great burning desire to win. He had a great pace. When he got past people, they never caught him. He was number one. There, there was no one around. Obviously, I'm slightly biased, but I think it's justifiable bias. He was the best. I think without a shadow of a doubt, Liam Brady was the best midfield player I've ever played with. You give Liam the ball and we get more people forward because we knew that he wasn't going to lose it. I think that uh, the one sadness for me is that Liam was Irish and that there's never been a strong enough Irish side around him. If he had been English, Italian, Brazilian, then we would have been talking of Liam Brady um, as the second pillar. We had a very good season, a very good league season. We got to the semi-final of the League Cup, only losing to Liverpool in a very close game, and managed to go all the way in the FA Cup final. Uh, and we met uh, with Ipswich to get the FA Cup final. These were dreams coming true. But an ankle injury took the shine off the final for Liam, and a Roger Osborne goal ended Arsenal's dreams. Defeat made Arsenal even more determined to get back to Wembley. We had an, an even more strenuous campaign the, uh, the following year. We had five games against Sheffield Wednesday before we got through the third round. We had to play teams like Nottingham Forest, uh, who were a top team at the time, Southampton away. We came through that after a replay. So uh, we went into the Manchester United Cup final uh, with the experience of having lost the year before, knowing what it was all about. And we went out and we took control of the game, I think, and we were 2-0 up at half-time and really we were coasting. I mean, there was no way we were going to lose. I could not possibly see us losing. And that carried on the same vein through the second half and we took the sting out of the game a lot. Um, we didn't really attack as much as we possibly could have done the second half, but at the same time we were so much in control that we didn't really need to. And uh, the writing was on the wall, the cup was going to be ours. The last two minutes... Um, Gordon McQueen pulled one back uh, from a corner, or from a cross anyway. And even then, like, uh, as a player on, on the pitch, I just felt that that was a consolation effort. Um, right, let's not do anything silly now. We've only got a minute to go, right? They're putting the ribbons, they're putting the, uh, they're putting the blue and yellow ribbons on the cup. Um, it's as though you could virtually see them doing it. And then um, the last minute, Sammy McElroy weaves in and out of three or four players, through somebody's legs, and in off the post. And then all of a sudden, like, Everything's just been snatched away. And we, we went back to the centre spot, uh, restarted, and it was just as though you were on automatic pilot. You're just going through the motions. But obviously then, straight from the kickoff, Liam got the ball, beat about three or four players, slipped it wide to Rixie. Rixie knocked it in. The keeper misread it, and the ball was just there to be knocked in. Well, the ball came to me uh, just after uh, we kicked off, and I decided, well, let's get it up their end. And I... I began to take a couple of people on. Uh, I went past uh, McCary, I remember him chasing me, somebody coming out from the back four. I managed to get around the side of him. Graham Ricks was bombing down the left of me. I just slipped him a nice pass, and enticed him to cross it, and he did put in a great cross. And there was Alan Sunderland at the far post. Well, that was my best season at Highbury. Uh, I'd been voted uh, PFA Player of the Year uh, a couple of months prior to that, which is 
great thrill for your fellow professionals to vote. But as Arsenal rejoiced, the future of Highbury's brightest star lay in the balance. Even prior to that cup final against Manchester United, that I began to think about going abroad. And uh, I'd had negotiations with Arsenal about a new contract, and I didn't find them at all satisfactory. I felt there were people coming into the club, uh, big signings, who were uh, placed on a scale much higher than the lads who were growing up there, or had grown up there. Keegan had just paved the trail uh, with Hamburg. Uh, he'd left Liverpool and gone to Hamburg, and uh, he'd done extremely well. So that gave me uh, great encouragement. I went into the next season, I, I told the hybrid fans, I wanted to tell them straight out what was in my mind. Oh, I could tell they were really on my side 100%. Uh, and, you know, when, when, I, when I got a goal, particularly goals like that, you know, it was a celebration for everyone. The hybrid crowd knew that their relationship with Liam was drawing to a close, but they were determined to park company on a high. Again, for the third season running, Chipper's skills guided the team to the FA Cup final. But in a season of 70 games, the final week meant heartbreak for Liam and his teammates. The first blow came at Wembley. And then, four days later, against Valencia, the final of the European Cup Winners' Cup was drawn. Extra time produced no result. So the cup was decided on penalties. I thought we were very unlucky to lose that match. We were the better team for the 90 minutes and the duration of extra time. But uh, the rules were that at a draw, at the end of extra time, it was penalties, and uh, and uh, we we suffered with that. Uh, I personally missed the first one, and then Graham, my great mate, uh, he missed in the sudden death, so we ended up with nothing. And then we had to travel to Middlesbrough two days later, and by the time we got to Middlesbrough, we were exhausted, and they ended up beating us five nil. And it wasn't very nice match to to finish on. I remember sitting in the bath at Middlesbrough and, you know, people saying good luck and they knew I was leaving. I was particularly sad to leave but also to have ended up with nothing. You were never going to be able to replace him, and uh, that was the bottom line. Um, Liam Brady has never been replaced at Arsenal Football Club. The heart went out of the team when Liam went, there's no doubt about that. You just cannot say no to an opportunity like that. Uh, and quite rightly, I think, in Chippy's case, he went there and, uh, and I think he, 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 he represented Great Britain in a magnificent way. We got married, went on our honeymoon, not knowing where he was going to uh, play. Uh, came back and he started the pre-season training with Arsenal, but all the time, you know, hoping something to happen. And uh, then one day he came home and said, oh, you know, Juventus want to sign me. Next morning he left for, uh, to join them in, uh, in Turin. They were at the pre-season camp. Um, had to be there for over two weeks, so I stayed yeah, in London while he went and uh, then he came back after the two weeks and off we went with two suitcases to, uh, to Italy. That's about all we went with. <laughs> I was in the close season when I left England so uh, there was hardly anything in the papers about me leaving or whatever. Uh, I remember going to Heathrow. Uh, I, I travelled with an Italian journalist um, and there was nobody to see me off, nobody coming with me from the British press, nothing like that. But uh, when the plane landed, it was just a mass of black and white uh, Juventus supporters waiting on me. 
to arrive. And something I didn't expect really, and it was really unnerving. We started uh, together, it was a new place for both of us, rather than me sort of heading back to London to live with him. It's a nice lifestyle, Italy, uh, it's easy going country, and not in a rush to do things. And as long as they saw that you were happy, then that, that made their day. If you said you'd love the food and, and everything, then they, they think that's, that's great. And just as the Bradys embraced Italy off the field, then the Italian crowds took to Liam's skills on the field. The event was packed with talent, and Liam was the brightest jewel, the playmaker, alongside players such as the great Roberto Bettega. Basically, the team really took to Liam, because despite the obvious problem at first with language, he showed a readiness to learn and was always willing to help out and adapt to become part of the team. There was something very appealing in his character. For instance, in the first game we played, a friendly in Brescia, he did something we all thought was pretty unusual. When the referee rang the bell for us to assemble in the tunnel before the game, Brady stood up and made a point of personally shaking hands with everyone. We Italians looked at each other. That was his way. It was great and it surprised us. In goal was the ageless Dino Zoff. È un ragazzo, un giocatore molto intelligente, di conseguenza non aveva difficoltà a trovare la posizione in campo. He is really intelligent both on and off the field. As a result, he had no problem at all fitting in. He was very much his own man and we respected him for that. Brady was very open-minded and contributed enormously to the team. There is no doubt about it. He played a really decisive role. We might have had seven or eight players who were in the Italian squad, but it was Brady who brought experience and personality to the side. And his role in midfield was vital. Not only was he the team's main goal scorer for two seasons, but he was the chief playmaker too. In Liam's first season, Juventus won the championship, inspired by the magical Irishman. He reached peaks of play mere mortals dream of, and he became a hero in the most fanatical of footballing countries. The following year, the team that contained six of Italy's World Cup winning sides was at the top of the table. But Juventus's president had his eyes on another midfield player, Michel Platini. Well, I was really happy, content in Turin. Uh, nice, nice lifestyle and the football was going well. Uh, but it all changed uh, three matches uh, from the end of the championship. Um, we, I was told uh, a day before the de transfer deadline for foreign players that the Juventus were going to sign Platini as well and I would have to leave. Uh, and it was uh, kind of devastating for me to be told in that way. Uh, if I had have really expected it, it would have been so much easier to accept, but uh, it was right out of the blue. Then for the final irony, in the last match of the season, Juventus needed Brady more than ever. Level on points, they needed to win the final game when they were awarded a penalty. Uh, the penalty came along and, you know, everybody looked at me, will I take it, won't I take it, so I, I decided to take it. I didn't realise what kind of reaction there was going to be to me scoring that penalty. But uh, they made it out to be some kind of a, you know, a wonderful uh, professional gesture on my part. Uh, not to miss it purposely, <laughs> because uh, because I had been told uh, I wouldn't be wanted anymore. A lot of Italian people <coughs> seemed to seem to think I, I would have been in my rights to kick it wide, <laughs> but uh, you know that didn't go through my mind. There was obviously a lot of pressure on me taking the penalty. It wasn't the best of penalties, but it went in and we won the title. And uh, you know I, I left Juventus in the best possible way. At Juventus, Italy's World Cup hero Marco Tardelli had become a special friend. He was my teacher, but when he goes in, in Sandoria, play for Sandoria, my teacher <laughs> go out. After Juventus, Liam's talents were in demand, and he moved to Sandoria with Trevor Francis. 
for a club like Sampdoria, who were just coming into the first division, to have the opportunity to have a player like Liam Brady in the team. Um, the supporters loved him. Wherever he played in Italy, whether it was Juventus, Sampdoria, Inter Milan or Ascoli, the fans always took to him. Because supporters, they appreciate talent, they appreciate ability. And Liam is oozing with it. Without doubt, Liam Brady is a world-class player. Uh, I felt that Liam was a world-class player before he went to Italy, playing with Arsenal. But going to Italy, playing regularly with uh, top-class players, and the influx of foreign players, such as the likes of uh, Platini, Boniak, Zico, Socrates, Falcao. Playing against these type of players week in, week out, uh, you know, it really does help to bring out the best in players. It's like being on the London Palladium every week. But after two highly successful years, Liam decided to move again to the mighty Inter Milan. Very exciting playing for Inter Milan because you know where they play is probably one of the best stadiums in the world, San Siro, and when it's full, there's nothing like it really. The president there, Pellegrini, wanted to uh, not establish Inter Milan but make Inter Milan uh, as it once was, you know, one of the best Italian sides. Hadn't won the title for a few years, and he brought me in. He brought Rummenigge in. Uh, we had Alto Belli there. Uh, a lot of the younger Italian uh, national teams, Ferry, uh, Bergami, Zenga and Goal. So we really had a strong side. And the world's greatest soccer stage was just right for Liam's superb skills. I would say that he had incredible all-round vision of the game and a brilliant left foot. He knew just how to set up a teammate for a good chance or the opportunity to shoot at goal and had that special ability to make really telling passes. Liam tried straight away to fit into the way we do things, becoming part of the team. He really wanted it to be that way. He wasn't arrogant, and because he's an intelligent guy, he realised that he was in a new situation and would have to adjust to it rather than it to him. This was the important thing. He's a gentleman. Uh, the people still remember him as a, as a man before than a player. He was a great player, of course, but uh, they still remember he's a gentleman of, uh, of football, uh, probably the best ambassador of English, uh, English people, not, not uh, only for the English soccer. It's had a big influence on my life, you know. My girl, uh, little girl was born here. She, she feels more Italian than anything, so she tells me. Uh, Obviously, the financial rewards of playing in Italy uh, have made me fairly secure, my family secure. Uh, and just to learn uh, a different lifestyle, uh, to fit into a different lifestyle, was such a great experience for me. Uh, one that I'll never forget and one that I won't uh, let go lightly. Uh, well, we're back here now, but I come back here regularly. Uh, I just love the place. But after two years at Inter Milan, Liam decided to move again, and his time in Italy was beginning to come to an end. I made a bad choice, really. I went for the one that was uh, offering the most money, and uh, that was a big mistake. Uh, that was to stay here in Italy and go to Ascoli. Uh, it was a bad move. Uh, it was one of those moves uh, where, when I signed the contract, uh, you know, I, I didn't really enjoy what I was doing. And all, all the time before, when I put pen to paper, I was a really happy person, but this time I, there was something inside me that I, I felt it was wrong, and it all went wrong. I didn't get on with the, the president there. He wasn't true to his word, uh, and I really I wanted out. And uh, after seven months there, uh, I was desperate to get away. And uh, John Lyle 
found me from West Ham, and that was like, uh, that was like a rescue service. The great players make time for themselves. They can improvise. They have a very, very astute brain, a quick, fast brain, quick thinking brain. And Liam has all those things. I think the greatest part of him is his involvement. He wants to be part of the team. He doesn't isolate himself as an individual. He loves success for other people as much as he loves it for himself. And uh, I can honestly say one of the great pleasures I've had in football is bringing Liam Brady into West Ham. So Liam returned to London and immediately began to stamp his class on the game, reminding Arsenal what they had been missing and showing West Ham youngsters the way. Watching him in a game when I was injured, you know, uh, you could see what sort of skills he had. His touch on the ball was tremendous. His left foot was unbelievable. I think we've got to say he's the best Irish player in the English game. He's always uh, put himself out to teach youngsters what to do and gives um, given me a lot of help in the game, gives me a little bit of advice. And I've taken it now. I think overall he's been a gentleman. He's never been in trouble. And um, there's no more I can say about the boat. The best memory of all that you know, relived to me for the day and day is when the last game of the season we played Wolves. Billy said to me, look, you can play from the very start if you want. And I said, well, no, uh, I prefer to come on. I prefer the team to be winning by a couple of goals and then I come on and be all that much easier. And it, lucky that I've always been, it worked out that way. and finished up scoring the last goal with the last kick of the game. And if that fairy tale ending wasn't enough, to mark the end of Liam's playing career, a record-setting 72nd international and a testimonial match like no other before. Very nice uh, for me, very, very happy occasion, very emotional one. Uh, obviously a little bit sad because that was going to be my final game in big time football. But um, also very happy that I was finishing in front of my own, own people. I think I'm proud of the fact that I've been a footballer and been uh, at the top for so very long. And uh, I thought it'd be nice uh, for them to share the final moment with me. Players have been arriving from all over Europe for the game, but for the Irish team, it's also in readiness for the trip to the World Cup in Italy, a trip that Liam is making as an observer. It had been fantastic for him to play in the World Cup and show the world audience uh, what a truly great player he is. Well, he's been phenomenal over the years for Ireland and uh, every other club that he's played for. He's been a legend over here, and no one can replace him. He won't be forgotten here for, for many, many years, you know, and I should always uh, admire him and it's been a pleasure to be associated with him. Even if you're, if you play at the stages that we're going to play at in our World Cup, Liam will always remain that bit above us all. He's been a great ambassador, not only on the pitch, but off the field as well. And uh, I hope it's a great day for him today. The journey has come full circle for Liam, and it's no wonder that the Dublin crowd love him so much. As an 18-year-old, he captured their hearts with that display against the Soviets. Since then, at a time when the George national the side was just missing out on real success, That's he at times single-handedly scaled the international heights. Yes, Liam Brady! But Jack Charlton's arrival as manager changed the team's style, and many felt a clash inevitable. I like Liam. I've been a Liam Brady fan all my life. He's someone that I not only have admired, but people throughout the world have admired. Like I say, give me a Liam Brady at 25, 26, and, uh, and he would be certainly part of this team. Fortunately, things come to an end.
And against Bulgaria, in a vital European qualifier, Liam showed the characteristics that Charlton admired. Closing down opponents, hard tackling, hard running, and those classic skills. There are very few players with a vision that Liam had. Most players play with their head down. Liam always played with his head up. He knew exactly what was going on around him. He knew where people were. And, uh, and he, was, he was a little bit more aggressive than people think when he wanted to be. That aggression against the Bulgarians led to Liam's expulsion from the field. An appeal gave him the chance to take part in the final. But then, fate dealt a severe blow. I playing for West Ham. Uh, I had a very bad knee injury. I tore my knee ligaments, my crucia uh, ligament. And uh, that paid to Germany altogether. So I kind of had it uh, now and taken away, and then had it again, it was taken away again. After. Uh, I had that serious injury. I think that's when my career with Ireland really ended. It was almost like a trial match against West Germany. And the game didn't go particularly well for me. I didn't, I didn't play very well. And so he pulled me off after 35 minutes. But I'd already known before that uh, my career with the Irish team was coming to an end. I would have preferred uh, that it could have been handled a little bit uh, more diplomatically. Uh, I didn't see any way out of the situation. Uh, I couldn't really swallow that one and, and, and carry on, you know, hoping. So, uh, without any animosity towards Jack, I said I prefer to call it a day. So with the decision made, Liam was able to leave the game he graced for so many years where he belonged, at the top. But what of the future? I want to uh, go into management of individual footballers. Uh, I've had a lot of experience dealing with uh, clubs and dealing with agents or consultants of footballers all down through the years and I feel that uh, there's, there's a vacuum there for someone to do it in a very professional and responsible way. And he's already made a start bringing integrity and wisdom to that side of the game. Just as he has steered his career as his own man from his native Dublin to the heights of the world game. But however well he does off the field, Liam will be remembered forever for his talent on it. It means everything to me and to have, to have experienced the very best in England and uh, the very best in Italy. Uh, I consider myself a very lucky person.